Right. Hello, everyone. Um, I know we should have around about 20 plus people joining us this, uh, this evening. Hopefully we get a few more. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Mervyn Morgan. I work with the ITP Support Association. Um, joining us today is our uh, medical expert, Dr. Gerard Crotty from the Middle Hospital in Ireland. We've also got some representatives from the ITP Support Association, Rhonda Anderson, Derek Elston and Anthony Hurd. They're all board members. Um, just remember, this uh, meeting is being recorded because lots of people um, say, can, can you record it so we can watch it afterwards or watch back afterwards? So uh, we are recording it. It will be um, published on our uh, YouTube channel probably tomorrow sometime. So you can all watch it again. Um, uh, just a couple of other housekeeping things. Um, we've got a meeting coming up in Liverpool uh, a week Friday on the 1st of March that is free to attend. So if anyone wants to attend that, you can register online for, via our website. Uh, I know that's not too far from, you know, some of you guys in Ireland. And we, we've generally had people from Ireland come across in the past. Um, in addition, uh, we've also got our patient convention coming up in May. So that is always well attended. And again, we always have people uh, coming across the RSC and they're always welcome. Always welcome. OK, so if we've got any, who wants to start with a question? First of all, someone must start. Um, I say Gay, over to you, Gay. Yeah. Hi. Um, it's about the shingles vaccine. I have ITP a few years, but my readings are good. I'm now just on 25 milligrams of azathioprine every second day, and I've been like that now for about a year. But with booster shots for COVID. It was going up and down. And the last time I was with hematology, um, I had a viral infection and it brought on asthma. So they decided just to leave it, things the way they are. So that's really my status. I'm on 25 milligrams every second day. And I did ask in the hospital about the, co the uh, shingles vaccine. And they said, yeah, sure. But I see on your website, you're saying not for people who are immune suppressed. So I just wonder, like, what's the rationale yeah, behind well, there, that? There are what should I tell two, them in the hospital? There are actually two types of shingles vaccine. Yeah. Um, and there is one which uh, is inactivated, so it's not a live vaccine. And uh, that is actually licensed in Ireland, uh, but it's unfortunately not reimbursed by the yes, uh, health yeah. authorities. So um it it's two doses a uh, number of weeks apart i'd have to check how many weeks but um it's actually you know um uh, it's license is for anyone over 50 so uh, not just people with a, a, a itp or another susceptibility uh, actually uh, anyone over 50 including myself and i dare say a number of the other people on the call um, whether they have ITP or not. Uh, and um, unfortunately, it is quite expensive. So the big issue for our patients at the moment uh, with the whole range of hematological diseases is uh, that if they're, if they're prepared to fund it themselves and including the general practitioner fee, it, it is uh, several hundred euro. Uh, I think I heard figures up to 600 euro initially, but I think it's come down to about... Mm. 350 or 400 or something you know so yeah. uh, for the two doses um and yet the inactivated vaccine uh is fine for immunosuppressed patients and is um as far as you know beneficial i mean there might be less some less efficacy if someone's on a lot of immunosuppressive therapy but mm. uh, a bit like the covid vaccine and so on it can um, it is presumably still beneficial, um, even though uh, some of the immunosuppressive agents might uh, slightly impair the response. Uh, so right at the moment, the cost is the major issue in uh, to to the patients here in the Republic, yeah. anyway. 
yeah. I think the situation is a bit different in some of the countries of the UK, and I'm not exactly sure which groups it's funded for. Yeah, um, it's. Um, I think it's around the 200, but I've had shingles three times, and luckily each time I caught it and I was able to take the antiviral, so it wasn't too bad, but I wouldn't like to get a, a bad dose of it, you know? Yeah, three times is a lot. I mean, people, yeah. um, and, uh, you know, certainly many, most of our patients with, say, hematological malignancies, with the, with the um, lymphomas and so on, we actually have them on... Um, prophylactic valet salivar, uh, you know, just a low dose of an antiviral all the time, 500 milligrams nice. every day. So for someone who has had recurrent bouts of shingles, if we were worth uh, considering trying that, it's quite a low dose and okay. really quite free from side effects and just one tablet That's every day. Good. Right, I, I, I mentioned that. Um, yeah, that, that's great. Thanks very much. And I mean, that is one thing that can be done in the absence of funding for the vaccine, for the inactivated vaccine. I, I mm -hmm. wouldn't give a live vaccine to someone with, immun with immunosuppression um, uh, because of the, you know, it, it contains a live virus. It's an attenuated virus and, and that uh, a live vaccine isn't um, necessarily safe when someone is immunosuppressed, uh, but the inactivated one is. Um so and um, you know, the other thing is is um, as well as potentially uh, you know um, prophylaxis with a low dose of an antiviral um, is just awareness of the uh, the symptoms and to go right away. You know, I mean, it's um, the pain often will come on maybe a day or two before the rash. Um, so it may be a little bit mm -hmm. it, it, for the first twenty four hours. It may be unclear why the, you have a pain on your one side or other, uh, yeah. anywhere from the top of your I, I head to your yeah. other end. So, yeah. you know. I, don't I, don't, I don't recall pain in any of the three. I, I well, just well, noticed then, the... You're lucky because actually and... the, the main, one of the main worries with, with, with shingles is the pain and the pain becoming persistent, what's called uh, post-herpetic neuralgia. And uh, mm -hmm. actually one of the advantages of going very quickly in the first few days, I mean, definitely under five days, you know, um, the sooner the better, to go and get the high dose antiviral treatment uh, is mm -hmm. that it, it it reduces the chance of having uh, prolonged pain. Yeah, right. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank Gay, you. is that fine? Yeah. You happy Sorry? with that? Yeah. You happy with that? Yes, I am. Yeah. Good yeah. stuff. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Profile access. Anthony, I believe you were saying in the chat you had shingles as well. Yeah, I did. In uh, just before, well, it was Christmas two thousand nine. Um, at that time, I was on prednisolone, um, but I've been on all the treatments I've had are immune suppressing treatments. So uh, since two thousand and six, I've been immune suppressed. And as I say, in two thousand and nine, it, it was prednisolone that was on then. Since then, I've had rituximab and azathioprine, and, and latterly, mycophenolate mofetil since. Yeah. yeah. Um, 2016. So yeah, it's a, it's an awful, awful experience. The most painful thing I've had for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, mate. Thanks. Thanks. Right. Next question. Anyone? There must be some. If I can, uh, maybe just grab Go some from that and shoot. I can uh, ask. Just, a... oh, you've got a question. Mark has okay. got a question. Yeah. Right. Go just, ahead, um, am I good to go? Um. I have uh, ITP for just coming up three and a half years now. And after initial kind of rocky period where it was difficult to get it under some kind of control, um, I've, I was on Avotrombopag, uh, 20 milligrams a day for, um, for about a year. And things were very stable for that period. And, and then they... Started to get a bit um stable. Um, well, my platelets went up to about two hundred and thirty, and on that basis, then the Avatrompa pack was reduced to three times a week, um, and within two and a half weeks, the platelets were twenty eight, um, and they've been kind of up and down ever since. But I was just wondering. 
you know, why after a long period of stability is is that usual that um or is it common that your responses start to change or no, what influences it, that? I mean it's not it's not all that common, although I mean one thing that can spark off a change at least for, for a period of time would be an infection is probably the most common precipitant of an exacerbation of ITP. Um the I mean obviously in, in your case the dose of the avatrombopag was reduced and um maybe in hindsight it was reduced too much. I mean it was reduced uh, quite appropriately, uh, but your plate account did go down. Uh, disappointed to hear that maybe I'm going back up to the previous dose that hasn't really stabilized. Um, and you know, people vary, um, in terms, you know, I mean, the plate account at 250 is, of course, in the normal range. Now, it's not if someone has very stable ITP, it's not necessary to keep it that high. Um, in fact, for most intents and purposes, if it's above 50, uh, or even a uh, figure lower than that in many cases, uh, you can have a perfectly normal life without bleeding. Uh, perhaps, okay, you know, perhaps some intervention if you need a procedure to, to get a, a level sufficiently high for, for particular types of procedure. Um, but so, yes, we would reduce the dose of a TPORA like Avatrampapag or l or Ramliptostim um, if the plate account is in, in the as you say, in the upper part of the normal range, or certainly if it's elevated. Um, but, you know, you know, obviously in your case, I presume the dose was put back up to the previous dose? It, it, it was put back up to the previous dose. And again, within two and a half weeks, the platelets were up to 360. All so right. then the, the dose uh, was reduced again. And again, within a week, um, they, they were down by 200. And within three weeks, they were down by 300. So, right. Down to, yeah. So, um, I, you know, there might be some very fine tuning required there, maybe. And, and yes, it is. I mean, this is one of the, the you know, the difficulties with uh, management of chronic ITP. Some patients, um, are very stable and you can predict you can see them we can see them six months apart in clinic and nothing has really changed and their place account seems to be the same every time we do it um even though it might it might only be 60 or 70 it, but it kind of is just very st um stable and other people are up and down now um hopefully you haven't had severely you know i, I mean there are a few patients and their plate account will regularly go, and they're quite a minority of patients with ITP, but their plate count can be like 400 one day in the clinic and can be two the next day, uh, you know, where the, you know, they can be in your clinic, everything seems to be fine. And then they're, they're admitted with extensive bruising and a plate count uh, below five uh, within days. So and in those patients um, with kind of, you might call it very brittle, ITP are, are unstable. It, it, it's difficult to manage that because, you know, we are a little concerned about the risk of thrombosis um, if we have the plate count very high. Now, only, again, it, only a minority of patients will actually have a thrombosis, but the risk is definitely significantly higher than the general population. And um, certainly we would want to try and avoid extremely elevated plate accounts uh but sometimes we'll we'll we we'll, we might have to settle for a plate account maybe a little bit higher than uh you know you know we might i mean 350 is still in the normal range so maybe if it's stuck at that level we'd, we'd be happy enough with that um particularly if you have no history of thrombosis you know but it is it is tricky um and um there's no one right answer as to whether you know Perhaps um, uh, adding another agent uh, in a few cases with a different mechanism of action, you know, a, a mycophenolate or, or, you know, another drug like that, I mean, a suppressant that works differently uh, might stabilize the situation. Uh, but I see, I think Anthony has put in the uh, comment there, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So, yeah, I mean, I think if, if, if you get a stable situation where the plate account is in the normal range, uh, uh, and um, uh, we can settle for, uh, there's a fairly wide range of what we can settle for 
if the patient is well. And the same would apply. I mean, someone whose pressure count is 50, you know, uh, that's fine. If they, and, you know, presumably they're, they're not bleeding. And um, uh, if we've got a stable situation, uh, we would very much try and maintain it. And uh, sometimes people fiddle around with the dose too much. And with those that class of drugs in general, they, they act on the cells, the megakaryocytes that, sites that make platelets. So there's more or less a 10 to 14 day delay before you really see their effects. So sometimes you'll find inexperienced doctors putting them up uh, and, and, you know, and a week later when nothing has happened, they put them up again, you know, and uh, or, or vice versa, reducing it. You have to kind of go slowly and, and make small changes. So certainly our practice when we reduce um, l trombopag or Avatrombopag is really very small doses, you know, just changes, sorry, very small changes, you know, um, you know, maybe if you're down to the, the low, the smallest tablet every day, go to five days a week rather than three days a week, you know, so you're, you're really uh, just moving the dial very slowly uh, yeah. so that you, you don't overcorrect. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Margaret. Um, Pat, you've got your hand up? Um, I did. I have a couple of questions, sir. Um, now, this medication, which you can buy over the counter, it's no, Nozohem, N-O-Z-O-H-A-E-M. That's supposed to stop no, severe nosebleeds. Do you, are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar with that. I can Google what the, I mean, that's a trade name, so it doesn't actually tell me what it contains. But uh, if you give me a minute or two, I can I can Google. Is it something taken by mouth or something applied to the nose? You, you, or? you, pop, you pop it up the nose. Right, you okay. Up and then pop it up the nose. Right. Because you know, so, I'm thinking about on an aeroplane if I have a, a bleed. Yeah, I mean, um, of course, if you're inclined to have a nosebleed, um, you know, I suppose there's a slight risk that poking something up your nose might even bring on a bleed, um, you know. So, um, and uh, with a lot of these over-the-counter things, if they're uh, sold not as, not, I mean, it's there are over-the-counter licensed medicines, like, say, paracetamol, which... It's a licensed medicine. You can buy it over the counter. But there are also a lot of um, products uh, which are available over the counter uh, from your health store or your supermarket and, and not, not requiring a pharmacy at all, and which are um, uh, not actually licensed medicines, but they're, they're classed as supplements or, or other um uh, products that are not licensed medicines. Yes, yeah, so it's a gem. I'm, I'm just seeing it here. So in this case, it says available. Yeah. So again, I'm looking at some advertising material for it here, and I'm just trying to see if I can see what's in it. There are, uh, how it works. It promotes constriction of the blood vessels. So I think it's um, in the general class of a, um, it, it's a, a vasoconstrictor. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, I say it's difficult to know without knowing whether there's any clinical trial data on it. Um, and, you know, when it's, if it's not, I, if it's not a licensed medicine, then the standard of evidence required for it to be marketed is a good bit less, you know. So um, the uh, I, I think with a lot of these things, uh, I mean, it sounds pretty harmless in a way, except as I said, just a physical trauma to your nose could 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 be a problem. But um, it, it, I would suggest maybe if you are prone to nosebleeds, try it and see. I mean, you know. And maybe not try it for the first time on a flight, but try it when you're when you're um, somewhere where it's less inconvenient to have a nosebleed and see um, if it if it works. I mean, I can um, uh, uh, you know it doesn't say on this 
add what, what the ingredient is. So I may have to, uh, I, if I find out anything, I'll, I'll let you know later in the the um, uh, in the meeting what it might contain. Pat, was you um, recommended that by a medical professional? Or... Uh, sorry? Was you recommended the, the, that drug by a medical professional? No, no, they, no, don't, they don't seem to know. Um, well, I, I worry. You, now, when you're on an aeroplane, because I travel a lot, does that air pressure have any effect on any kind of bleeding, you know, with our disorder? And what should not, I take? Not, not really. Um, modern modern um, uh, airliners are... You know they're they're pressurized to, uh, you know not to ground level air pressure, but uh, only mild, very mildly reduced from that. You I mean you do feel your ears popping a little bit as you go up, but it's not severely low uh, pressure. It is, however, on a long haul flight. I mean the air on a plane is quite dry, yeah, long haul, and your your mucous membranes can dry out, and your nose might feel dry, and perhaps that could precipitate a bleed. Um, actually, I have my Google search has revealed uh, the ingredients, and um, it says here nosohim contains glycine and calcium, and also citric acid monohydrate, which presumably is just a buffer to stabilize the pH, glycerol, hydroxymethyl cellulose, which are just, I think, to thicken it to make it into a gel, and purified water and uh, preservatives to stop bacteria growing in it. So it they seem fairly innocuous in, ingredients. So um, it uh, it's probably quite safe to put anywhere in your body. But in fact, whether it actually works and whether there's clinical trial data for it and how uh, you know some of these products that are not a licensed, if they're not a licensed medicine, and again, I don't know fully what its legal status is. Uh, the the number of people in a clinical trial. Or, or a study of it to say that it works, it would be much less stringent than, say, for a licensed medicine. Yeah, I, I carry that trans um, examic medication. Tanexam yeah, yeah. tanexamic acid. Is, it takes is a good. long But how long does that take to work? Because I've taken that before when I've been bleeding. And, I mean, how, well, it doesn't well, work right away, does it? No, well, if you take it by mouth, of course, it has to be absorbed. I mean, in the emergency department, if you're admitted with bleeding of, of some following trauma, for instance, it's given intravenously because it gets into the system a bit quicker that way. But obviously, that's not practical for, for uh, not not appropriate for self-administration. Uh, yeah, you're right. It, it, you know, an oral treatment won't work immediately. No. So how many minutes? Because I, I've bled from different places and I've taken that and um, it doesn't seem... To work, but of course, you say it's got to be absorbed by the stomach. It's got to be absorbed by the stomach. I mean, most drugs are taken by mouth. It would would take, you know, I suppose fifteen to thirty minutes to be absorbed. You know, I mean, you you won't get. I mean, there are a few drugs that are uh, taken by another method, such as as uh, an inhaler or or um, uh, okay. under the tongue, which are absorbed much quicker. Uh, but I mean, a bit like when you take paracetamol for a headache, how long does it take to work? You know, or it, it has to be absorbed. And it's be very similar with 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 uh, most uh, oral medications. Yeah. So the thing is, really, you know, after you've been bleeding twenty minutes before it works, you've lost a lot of blood. Um, but you said well, you could get by an inhaler. You said I could get that. Medication. No, I, I, I'm just talking in general about oral drugs uh, versus other routes of administration for drugs. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not aware of any any drug you can self administer that would that would we um stop bleeding quickly. Um, I mean, I think it's other measures like you know um adopting a, a, a appropriate position and uh, you know um uh, the use of tissues and so on to to staunch the bleeding. You know the um uh, the the thing about um uh, I mean bleeding is is obviously distressing um. Uh, but, uh, you know, it would only be in, in more extreme cases that you would lose a lot of blood from a nosebleed. It, it actually can look a lot more dramatic than in terms of the actual volume of blood loss. Uh, a relatively small amount of blood can make 
a, a towel or whatever look rather um, uh, heavily bloodstained. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is distressing. And, um, uh, you know, I think the main thing is to, uh, is to optimize the treatment for the ITP uh, before traveling, uh, if at all possible. And um, uh, you know, have a, ideally a, a relatively safe platelet count. Now there are people who have a very low platelet count and and um, can tolerate that quite well. Because we've discussed in these meetings before about people um, uh, who who had very refractory ITP, in other words, ITP that didn't respond to treatments, and um, were have um, had to go around with a, a really very low place account for a long time. So your mileage may vary, basically. Some people will have um, these rel clinic what we call clinically relevant non-major bleeding. In other words, they're bleeding, which is not kind of a, a major event in terms of requiring blood transfusion or admission to hospital, uh, but it's, um, it's, it's still, you know, you have to go and do something to stop it if it, if it occurs. Okay, thanks, Pat. Thank you for them. Some good questions there. Um, who's next? Who's got any other questions? I was going to say, Gerard, that there's been lots of, um, you know, we keep getting phone calls in the office of late about it would appear COVID is rearing its head again. Um, have, have you had the same in Ireland with, you know, patients contacting you? Yeah, well, COVID has, um, I mean, it continues to come in waves to, yeah. to a degree. I mean, um, and uh, I think it's still early years in terms of, of COVID. And um, we would uh, perhaps assume, but we, I, I think it still has to be shown whether it's true or not, that it will settle down into a regular winter thing i mean we know you know rs3 uh, occurs most winters in the early november december period flu occurs uh, about a month later um and then have i by about now has has faded away and um maybe covid will settle down into being a, a regular winter virus um you know uh because a very large proportion of the population have had it and have uh, immunity and of course most people have been vaccinated um, uh, and have a degree of immunity from, from both of those but uh, uh, yeah it hasn't gone away and uh, the recent winter COVID has been there um, I think probably not as many clinical cases as um, influenza or yes. RSV there were a lot of uh, people admitted to hospital uh, with um, one or other of those viruses. Um, not particularly now talking about ITP patients, just uh, members of the public, uh, adults and children. Um, and uh, I think fewer numbers of COVID were were um, reported. But of course, most it, it's only people who get admitted, really, that get tested. Hardly anyone who feels well enough to stay at home actually uh, goes and gets formally tested with a PCR test and uh, re reported to the health authorities in yeah, terms of yeah. COVID. Understand. Thanks so much, Gerard. Uh, Dolores, you got your hand up? Got a question? Oh, yeah, uh, um, Mervyn, there is one in the chat as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll sort that out. Uh, Dolores? Yeah, so I suppose it, my question was in, in relation to COVID, um, and I'm just wondering if there's any kind of any research in terms of COVID and ITP. So just, I suppose, my own personal, um, so I, I was diagnosed with ITP. Um, I was in hospital for a procedure. I ended up getting COVID um, and had my first kind of real experience with ITP where my platelets had dropped to five. Um, now they managed to get it under control and it came back up, kind of hovered between 50 and 80. They never went any higher than 80. But I suppose my second um, serious kind of um, relationship with COVID was um, I went to get my COVID vaccine and a couple of days later I ended up back in hospital again with my platelets at nine um, and it was just they, they, that, that's only been my two kind of really low that's my two experiences where they've been really low um, and I suppose at, at first when when I was when they were first realized that um, none of the treatments so I was put on the steroids um, 
and I was I was put on IVIG and neither of those worked. I suppose it was just in time that they gradually increased. Um, but they've never kind of gone any higher than between 50 and 80. I'm just wondering if there is any association or is it just was it just a coincidence with COVID? No, there, well, there is an association. I mean, we've known about an association um, with not necessarily the, uh, be, being the cause of ITP as such um, in adults in that probably most people with chronic ITP, there it's, uh, you know, a virus is not uh, the only or main cause. They, uh, in some cases, a patient might have a, a moderately low platelet count for, for years uh, without real knowing or having a diagnosis. And it's often said that the onset of, uh, of ITP in adults is often insidious, you know, very gradual or, or, or is almost silent. Um, but that it can be that a virus infection or in some cases the vaccine can precipitate um, an exacerbation or, or a worsening of ITP. And we've known that for years with flu vaccine and, uh, you know, uh, other infections. Um, so uh, it's not um, an entirely random association. Of course, in an inv individual patient, you know, no one can quite answer the question, would you have had, would you have had a, an exacerbation of your ITP just at this time anyway? Or is it due to the um, uh, the uh, uh, infection or, or, or the vaccine? Um, if the time relationship is very tight, then, you know, I mean, if, if we and particularly if you have documented, if you, you know, if, you, if your measured place account is 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 uh, very satisfactory and then you get the COVID vaccine and then seven days later, your place account is, is below five. I mean, it's quite likely that it did precipitate it. I mean, um, during the initial uh, phase of COVID vaccination, of course, um, the entire cohorts of the population, I mean, uh, well, everyone eventually, but uh, the uh, people over a certain age were all asked to go and get the vaccine and, and hundreds of thousands of people went and did. And of course, every patient that came into the ED with um, almost any problem asked, is this due to the vaccine I had last month or the month before? Uh, and of course, in most cases, the answer was no, the vaccine was not the cause of the heart attack you've had uh, or the stroke you've had or the um, uh, what, uh, whatever else you've had, you know. So because it, basically the patient was in an age group where, well, nearly all people in that age group had in fact had the vaccine because they were all told to go at that time of the year because now it was available to that age group. Um, but leaving that aside, the um, it, there are cases definitely where vaccines, I mean, you know, different ITP pay, cases are different. And in terms of the impairment of the production of the platelets versus the destruction of the platelets and whether it's mainly the, the T cells or the B cells, all these things vary a bit. And um, so whether something that stimulates the immune system, such as the vaccine, causes a worsening, it does vary between patients. A lot of patients, uh, they get the vaccine, has no effect at all. I mean, for patients who've had episodes of severe thrombocytopenia due to their ITP in the relatively recent past, what I... Um, suggests them uh you know particularly with the the importance of covid vaccination over the last few years was to go ahead and get the vaccine but to arrange to have a plate account five or seven days later just to sort of at least catch it if it is going down and and um uh won't prevent it going down but at least we could start treatment relatively early um for that exacerbation or increase whatever treatment they're already on thank you Thank you very much, Dolores. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Lauren. A uh, question is, what would you say to a patient with significant fatigue but has a relatively stable platelet count on minimal treatment and minimal bleeding symptoms? Now, I know uh, in, in the past we've had patients who've said the platelet count is just below 100, but they still have extreme fatigue. Is is that common, Gerard, is it? or? Uh it is a recognized symptom um, yeah. of ITP, um, and uh, the studies do seem to indicate that it is a real uh, thing, that it is a, a truly a symptom of ITP for, for a significant number of patients, um, and not always well correlated with the platelet count. Um, uh, there's probably some correlation when the platelet count is lower, maybe the fatigue is worse, but it's not a constant relationship. 
Of course, fatigue is, uh, or tiredness, the less pathological version of it, I mean, uh, is something that everyone uh, suffers from so, uh, time to time. I mean, if we just stay up too late tonight, uh, I'll be tired tomorrow. So, you know, and, and not being too facile about it, but uh, also stress, um, whether at home or at work or uh, many other um, uh, reasons and other medical problems uh, can lead to fatigue. So it is a little difficult to uh, be sure that the fatigue is is really a symptom of the ITP. So it is a bit of a dilemma. Do we increase the ITP treatment? And uh, I think the data on what treatments would uh, potentially relieve it is lacking. Uh, so certainly if the plate account is too low, we would be, um, or the patient, ha in particular the patient has bleeding or bruising symptoms, we would look at optimizing the treatment of the ITP. And I see there, Anthony has put in the um, uh, in the chat about um, uh, spoons, uh, which I, I can't explain, but um, maybe Anthony can, uh, but uh, about um, basically pacing or, you know, Graduated exercise, I think, might be a very similar uh, concept. Um, certainly, um, if you're feeling very fatigued, uh, the temptation may be to just rest completely, but that is not the right thing to do. I mean, for a lot of the um, uh, these type of symptoms, uh, the um, maintaining uh, a, a, a degree of activity and exercise, so you may have to to do it in a phased way, is um, uh, uh, beneficial as well as you know try to optimize sleep and and um, diet uh, a good diet as well. Um, yeah, so I think it's an area that probably needs more study um, and um, uh, not always uh, necessarily a prescription. Uh, is is the actual uh, way to deal with it? Yeah, yeah. Just very quickly on that, I know Anton has said that there's a few videos on fatigue on our website. If if you go to the playlist part of uh, our YouTube channel, a couple of years ago we did a symposium on the second day of our convention, all on fatigue, and there's several uh, good videos of all the. The um, you know presentations that were done, the talks that were done. I think there's four videos, there. so you know that could be useful for people. But Anthony, what's this spoons? Yeah, it's it was developed by uh, a lady who I think is, was living with fibromyalgia, which is a very uh, tiring and debilitating illness. One of the main features of that is fatigue and tiredness and okay, okay. All, all sorts. So it was developed by her really. And <clears throat> it is basically just a way of pacing yourself. So you apply um, a spoon or, or you, you imagine a, a row of spoons that um, represent the amount of energy that you believe you've got and allocate a, a certain number of spoons to doing various activities so you know making a cup of tea might be one spoon uh running around the block might be 20 spoons so you know you allocate the, uh, okay. the number of spoons to certain activities but knowing that you've only got x amount of spoons um in your um cutlery drawer if you like for you <laughs> <laughs> but of course each of us will have different numbers of spoons yeah, depending yeah, on our yeah. our um situation so okay but okay. it's worth looking at. It's interesting yeah, anyway. It's yeah. another way it's of pacing, isn't it? Yeah. Pacing. It's another yeah. option. Yeah. yeah Rhonda, you, you got your hand up? Um, yes, I just wanted to, um, you know, come in on that, really just saying the same thing, but I think it helps if, you know, people support you with the same information. I mean, the thing about fibromyalgia is that it's a lot of muscle pain as well. So the pain, I think, is really the thing that triggers all the other things. Uh, when I do my expert patient program um, tutoring, um, we have a lot of people who have fibro and it's uh, that they do find it very fatiguing. But the things that I, I wanted to bring up was you to find out first, one of the first things you can find out is if you're on medication, is it actually your medication that is making you tired? Because that can be the side effect of some medications. And the other thing is, 
for people to have enough protein in their diet. So a lot of people will cut down on protein. I mean, we're all told not to eat too much red meat. Well, that's all very well. But if you're on a, a, a very low protein diet, that will make you feel tired too. And it doesn't help you to heal if you have anything like a virus or anything, or if you've got any problems. And also the exercise one, when you're not feeling as though you've got any energy, you probably don't want to exercise. But the thing is, if you go and do a small amount of exercise and just don't forget, you don't have to go out to do exercise. You can walk up and down the stairs in your own house or around a room or around your garden or something. Uh, so even if the weather's not good, you can still do some exercise and there's masses of stuff online about exercise and gentle exercise and then just build it up. People often find if they start doing a little bit of exercise, they actually feel as though they've got a lot more energy. So it, it's a matter of, you know, you can start off with one minute of exercise. You don't have to run the marathon. Mm -hmm. Do one minute of exercise and then build it up to two, to three, to four, to five. If you're well enough, you can start off with 10 minutes and build it up or a walk around the block. It's just really working out. And this is this is what we do on the Expert Patient Program, which I've written an article for. It's going to be in the next platelet. And, um, you know, it's building up action plans. So you say you're going to do 10 minutes of exercise at 10 o'clock in the morning and you're going to do it three days a week and just build it up like that. It's very helpful. And the, the spoons theory is very good because, um, you know, it makes you realise that you've got a limited amount of, of energy and to pace it out. It's basically about pacing. So don't use all your energy first thing in the morning uh, when you know that you won't, you'll be too tired to do anything in the afternoon. And even then, when you are tired, you may not sleep very well. So that's sort of the, the exercise also helps people to sleep better. So I just want to reinforce that all of those things are really important. And they're not sort of great clinical things. They're very much common sense yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just also uh, on the spoons bit, Lawrence put the link in the chat for the spoons theory on Wikipedia. And Dolores has just asked a question. Um, do we have any idea of the numbers of people in Ireland with chronic ITP and how rare are we? Just, I, just I'm before we go on, it's, that... it's, 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 it's you know, the same percentage as it is for the rest of the UK. Uh... Yeah, now just before we go on to the incidence and prevalence, um, uh, I noticed uh, Anthony has put in a comment there on uh, drugs interrupting sleep. And of course, I mean, I was going to, I mean, in terms of tiredness and um, uh, other symptoms, uh, steroids have to be um, uh, watched really and, and reduced as quickly as possible, really, in most patients. Um, to avoid side effects, which can include, include uh, a disturbance of sleep and of mood, um, as well as uh, many other uh, symptoms. Uh, so, in fact, I, you know, I was going to come back to come, you know, we, when we were talking about the uh, shingles and the risk of that. Um, uh, you know, steroid getting the steroid dose down is is probably the biggest trend in ITP over the last. If you were to say over my career, really, in hematology, when I began in hematology, we gave people very high doses of steroids and we continued it for a long time. And um, in some cases, perhaps the, the side effects of the steroids were nearly as bad as the, the ITP. Um, and of course, now we have many other drugs. So that if the steroids, uh, if too much steroid is required for too long, we have from most patients, for the vast majority of patients, other drugs such as l trombopag avitrombopag, uh, ramiplastim, rituximab, and, and others that can be uh, added uh, that can get the steroid down. Um, and just, I, I wasn't aware, Anthony, that microphenolate can interrupt sleep. Um, I, 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 I didn't know that. Um, Sadly. Yeah, it does a bit. Yeah, it's not as, nowhere near as bad as the prednisolone. Right. Nowhere okay. near as bad. I have heard of people do with the... Um, L-trombopag and the dietary restrictions, 
uh, because they eat at very regular times, having an alarm in the middle of the night to wake up and take it. I think that's a bit maybe not the best plan because that's going to definitely uh, disturb your sleep and lead to, to a degree of tiredness. Um, so going on then to the... Um, uh, and, and I see Anthony have another comment there about uh, mindfulness and uh, various apps. Uh, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of um, uh, help out there. And I suppose uh, with, uh, with, with a lot of those things, uh, try it and see what works for you. Uh, but I would very much say, you know, um, the um, uh, general advice uh, on sleep and exercise uh, is... Uh, and diet uh, is uh, is important um, and probably applies to every patient I see in the clinic, regardless of whether ITP is what they have or not. Um, getting between seven and nine hours sleep, uh, getting some exercise, also getting some, doing some strength um, exercise. Um, and again, likewise, uh, you, you know, I mean, if you can lift a heavy dumbbell, do three sets of 10, fine. Um, and, but if, if you know if you can't lift very much start off with a, a bottle of water in each hand or fill it half full of water if if you're finding it tough with a full bottle of water so you know um i think we should all be doing particularly as we get older doing some uh, uh muscle exercises uh but going um going on from that the other the next question was that the other one we were going to discuss was just the uh the um number of people who have chronic itp i mean it, it's much easier to get figures for how um, the incidence, the number of new diagnoses, if you Google um, prevalence of ITP, what you find actually is the incidence, two to four or you know, around three to four cases per 100,000 per year of ITP occur. And, um, but I mean, I, so I, I'm not, you know, the prevalence in other words, the number of people who have Maybe they weren't diagnosed this year. They were diagnosed a number of years ago, um, but they still have chronic ITP. That figure would be a little bit higher, therefore. Um, but I don't have a good um, idea of what the figure is. Um, I uh, don't believe it's any different in Ireland to any other countries. I'm not sure that we're very good. What data. I would do, Gerard, uh, because um, I've, I've been doing a funding application with Dr. Nicola Cooper for this, and we, we we've been trying to work out what the overall number of people is with ITP at any one time, and it's a lot more than the incidence. So I've I've actually got that number somewhere. What I do when I publish the, the video, I'll actually put it in the um you know video description as well, like no, so uh, people are aware. But but it is a lot lot more yeah. than the incidence. You know, the three to four in a hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah, yeah, probably it would be a few times that anyway. I'd say four or five times that probably. Yeah, yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I see another comment there. Um, from, I mean, um, just on the incidents, um, uh, uh, Anthony heard, um, at that, yeah, there, I mean, there are ITP is considered a rare disease. Of course, if you're a hematologist and you have an interest in it, it doesn't seem rare. And patients will sometimes tell you, well, you told me my disease was rare, but the patient beside sitting beside me in the waiting room had the same condition. Well, that's because you're in the hematology <laughs> clinic. Uh, it's rare in the rest in the rest of the, your, your life, uh, 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 wherever else you are, that's not the hematology clinic, it's going to be rare. Um, and, but of course, rare diseases combined are uh, quite common. Um, because there are thousands of them that are individually rare, and so they, they many rare diseases have been under studied over the years. And um, actually, we're we're coming up to Rare Disease Day when 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 there is a leap, leap year. Rare Disease Day is is celebrated on the twenty ninth of February, a rare day. But of course, uh, um, uh, the organisations don't want to do fundraising just once every four years. So um, it's I think celebrated on twenty eighth when there isn't a leap year. Um, so, um, just going back to the, the comment before that from Margaret Griffin about, um, uh, I think, uh, Margaret, in terms of, um, knowing whether platelets production is reduced or whether they're being destroyed, we don't actually have a good test for that. 
Um, ITP is a diagnosis of exclusion. There isn't a blood test that we can say to the GP, send off a tube of blood with this test, and if it comes back positive, it's ITP, and if it comes back negative, it's not. Um, and likewise, within ITP, we don't have in routine clinical practice a way of really saying to what degree the production of platelets is reduced. Um, so it, it is actually much more empiric than that. It's based on, um, well, what is the response rate in the, the trials? What are the side effects of the drug? And uh, therefore, in a particular situation for a patient, which drug are we going to try? And there, there may be a degree of trial and error. You, you start someone on um, uh, a drug and it um, if it, if it doesn't work, then we may try something else. And it's not really based on any uh, definitive evidence in that patient, whether it is just mainly destruction of the platelets or inhibition of the production of the platelets. Does that help, Margaret? Yeah? Great stuff. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Margaret. Right, we've got it. We're in the last eight minutes now. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I just had one to Imagine. throw in that, that might sort of um, touch on some of the things we've already talked about. Uh, is there any suggestion, or I'm sure no evidence, but suggestion that us ITP folk might be lacking in certain vitamins or minerals? Um, it's one that gets raised quite a lot on the social media sites, so I just thought it might be worth exploring today. Um, no, I'm not aware of any <laughs> data on that. Mm. I mean, of course, if you have chronic increased blood loss uh, uh, from, say, heavy periods, um, uh, you may be deficient in iron, which is a pretty mm. common condition anyway. Uh, mm. So, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, if, if someone has what appears to be ITP, but they're also a bit anemic, then iron deficiency mm. is extremely mm. likely to be the, the cause of that. Um but I'm not aware in terms of the cause of ITP, I'm not aware of any data on any any particular yeah. deficiency. I mean, vitamin D is, we think of vitamin D as being a vitamin for the bones. It is also a vitamin for the immune system. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I noticed actually just very recently some I Irish um, public health guidance on um, recommending that very large proportions of the population should probably take vitamin D. I only saw it just earlier this, this evening, um, not related to ITP at all, but just um, uh, older people over 65 mm -hmm. should take uh, vitamin D all year round. And um, many other groups should probably take it uh, between Halloween and St. Patrick's Day, which is a very easy yeah. way of remembering uh, the <laughs> period. Um, and of course, uh, vitamin D we make from sunshine. Uh, but even when the sun is shining now, because we're worried about skin cancer and everything, we're not yeah. going out and getting sunburned or staying out for very long in the sun. So, um, uh, you know, probably most of us should be taking vitamin D, at least in winter, uh, yeah. not in mega doses, but in, in, in uh, the, the recommended uh, doses. Mm -hmm. And um, but evidence that that actually prevents autoimmune diseases is lacking. Yeah. Thanks I thought, much, I thought that might be the case. <laughs> <laughs> Rhonda, you got your hand up? Yeah, it's very difficult with all these claims of, um, you know, uh, cures, miracle cures and vitamins and stuff. Yeah, very difficult. I just wanted to ask um, Gerard if he could just give us a little very quick outline of how IVIG is now being used with um, um, ITP. Yeah, IVIG, um, intravenous immunoglobulin, um, it is a blood product. Now, it's, it's very, very safe, really. Uh, but it's, it's not, I mean, it, it, it's a prolonged infusion and it's not free from side effects. Uh, one of the most significant ones is a headache, sometimes quite severe. And even, you know, I mean, and when a headache occurs in someone who has a plate account, you know, a severe headache occurs in someone admitted with a plate account, um, below 10 or below 5 uh, inevitably the question comes up could it be a bleed and um, a, a, a CT maybe in the middle of the night is done um, almost inevitably it isn't a bleed uh, but so it's, it's, it's in my view it's, not, it, it's definitely one of the first line treatments but it's not 
the main one. And steroids are still the the go to uh, first line treatment for most patients. Uh, but if there's a contraindication to steroids or you need a quicker response, uh, then immunoglobulin and intravenous immunoglobulin is given. And if you have a severe emergency, someone with you know um, who has severe life threatening uh, or you know or brain threatening bleed. Uh, we would give probably everything together, steroids, IVIG, and maybe plated transfusion as well, which is the other uh, emergency treatment that it's only used if it's an emergency. Um, so IVIG is probably overused maybe um, in that patients get admitted with, um, uh, you know, uh, we don't treat, uh, you know, as you say, it's not free from side effects. So we, we don't really treat just based on the platelet count. And particularly in children, uh, people can have very low platelet counts uh, and it might not need treatment at all. And children with acute ITP, the pediatricians have got much more uh, used to actually observing and maybe not treating at all. Uh, it, you know, if the patient doesn't have significant bleeding and in children, of course, it's, it's very often acute ITP and it may within a few weeks recover more or less completely and eventually go away completely and not come back. Um, whereas in adults, it may, it may be chronic ITP. Um, so really, I think um, intravenous immunoglobulin is uh, for certain situations where we have severely low platelets um, and uh, particularly if we want to get a rapid response. One situation it might be someone who's got chronic ITP, you know, is tolerating a low platelet count, maybe 20 uh, long term, but now they need surgery and we want to do it within a few days or they have a procedure planned for a certain date and we might want to give the IVIG um, to ensure as far as possible that the procedure is not cancelled and that their plate comes up on a certain day and it fairly predictably produces a, a good response at a week. So we would try and give the IVIG one week before such a planned procedure. Um, and uh, another situation where we may, I mean, again, in pregnancy, we can use either steroids or IVIG. Of course, most of the other drugs used for ITP are not uh, generally used in pregnancy. I mean, in a few rare cases, uh, uh, drugs that are officially not approved may be used because we don't have any alternative. But uh, steroids, intravenous immunoglobulin, or, or azathioprine as well, because there has been some a lot of usage over the years can be used in pregnancy. But um, so we will, you know, uh, uh, particularly a, a pregnant lady who has uh, platelets. Perhaps they've been adequate during most of pregnancy, but now they're approaching delivery, and we want to try and ensure a platelet count uh, over fifty at delivery, or or actually somewhat higher to allow an epidural if that's desired. Um, uh, again, IVIG has a fairly predictable response, is safe in pregnancy, and uh, that would be another situation where it would be commonly used. Whereas, you know, uh, someone else requiring treatment over a, a nine-month period is not uh, pregnant, would hopefully be ha have them on some second-line agent that might produce a more sustained response, but most of those agents we can't uh, give during pregnancy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Thank you. I think well, we come right to the end now. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Crotty for uh, his time this evening, and I hope you've all found all the you know the answers to the questions useful. Um, thank you, Gerard. It's been an uh, excellent meeting again, as always. Um, I will re I will schedule the next round of these meetings in a month or so. So, um, you know, please keep a look out on the website. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And I hope you found it useful. The video will be up hopefully tomorrow. Thank you and good night, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.